Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, one of India's greatest freedom fighters. 77 years, uh, you know, after his official death, even now he still continues to make headlines. There has been a recent uh, decision by the Indian government to install his statue uh, in Lutton's Delhi. Plus, there have been films uh, around his life and death. And there are so many aspects of this fascinating man which uh, keep uncovering and revealing themselves. Today, for this book club, uh, joining me is Mr. Chandrachur Ghosh who is going to share some very interesting insights uh, from the life of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose, which he's written in his latest book, The Untold Story of an Inconvenient Nationalist. So Mr. Ghosh, thank you so much for joining us in this uh, book club today. Thank you, Akshay. Thank you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, Mr. Ghosh, my first uh, question to you is, I was very intrigued by the name of your book, the untold story of an inconvenient nationalist. So why do you call him an inconvenient nationalist? Well, uh, the unique characteristic of Subhash Chandra Bose was that uh, he could not be defined by any particular ism and he could not uh, subscribe to any political party, party heart and soul, uh, forgetting the larger interest uh, of India's liberation. So uh, with India's liberation, India's freedom, and development of the country was absolutely supreme for him. And everything else was subservient, be it a political ideology, be it the interests of a political group, or anything. Let's talk about anything. We're all subservient. All he would see was whether anything was uh, contributing to his work for India's freedom. So in that manner, when we find there were different schools of thought, competing with each other. So there was the Gandhian High Commission uh, with a very fanatic uh, uh, attachment to Satyagraha and non-violence. We find the communists, which, uh, which subscribed to the communist uh, international thought uh, dictated by or led by, the, uh, by Moscow. Uh, we find the Congress Socialist Party uh, somewhere lying in between with the Socialist School of Thought. But with a strong sense of a group, a separate group, separate identity. Uh, and then we find uh, groups like uh, parties, like the Muslim League, the Hindu Mahasabha. Hindu Mahasabha came into the scene as a political entity a little later, uh, much later in, late, in the late 1930s. But it was there. And so what Bose was doing, and, 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 and on top of this, there were the revolutionary societies. So there was uh, the traditional uh, revolutionary societies from Bengal. Bengal was a hub of secret revolutionary societies. The Anushilan Samiti, the Jugantar Party, and numerous smaller groups. There was the uh, Sri Sangha, there were the Bengal volunteers. And uh, all these groups had uh, worked hard to retain their own identities. And what Suvas was trying to do was to bring as many uh, groups together as possible on a common platform with the sole objective of uh, accelerating freedom. And he had taken a very, very aggressive and radical stand from the point he uh, joined uh, politics. And particularly when he came onto the national political platform there around 19, towards the end of 1927. Uh, before that, he had joined politics in 1921, but uh, he, his role at that time was limited uh, to the regional politics and uh, assisting this one to Chitaranjan Das in his work for the Swaraj Party. Uh, so in 1927, when he came uh, onto the national platform, from the very beginning, he took the absolute categorical stand that in India's goal and the Congress Party's goal should be independence, complete independence. And at that time, there was a lot of debate going on whether independence should be the goal or whether it should be called Swaraj or should it be called dominion status. So a lot of waffling, a lot of uh, circumlocution, different people with different ideas, uh, trying to define their own terms. Uh, all, uh, there was a very complex uh, dynamics that was going on. So in that position, he had kept his uh, ideas very clear. And very soon, he ran into a conflict, a clash with the Gandhian High Command. So he became a, a problem child for the Gandhian High Command, so to speak, and remained so. And... Uh, Later on, uh, 
even the Cong Congress Socialist Party or the Communist Party were found their own problem areas with him. He was nobody's man. He was only, the only thing that mattered to him was India's independence. So he pushed his own agenda, the aggressive agenda, and the, these political groupings came to be very, very unhappy with him for various reasons, which uh, I have described in detail, the areas of conflict that happened. Uh, but then this uh, thing, this conflict, this clash culminated when he then head on uh, into uh, a fight with the Dargan High Command in the Congress Party for his re-election as the president of the Congress. And uh, that's when things started taking a very, very different turn. And obviously, uh, when he defeated Mahatma Gandhi's candidate, as his, uh, who was his opponent, it was not taken lightly. And uh, the Gandhian forces uh, came together to practically oust him from the Congress. There was a period where briefly the Congress Socialist Party and the communists and other leftists uh, tried to come together on a common platform didn't work out because they had their own agendas. The communists, for example, were very worried that Suvas' uh, aggressive politics was eating into their uh, mass base, into their own constituency. So they wanted to stop that. The Congress Socialist Party uh, leaders like uh, Jaya Prakash Narayan, Raman Ohalaria were worried that Suhas was going for a very clean break with Gandhi leadership. They were not happy about it. Although the provincial uh, units of the Congress Socialist Party well, at the same time, I'm happy with Jaffa Narayan and Ramona Loya and Minu Masani, the leadership, and they were trying to come closer to Subhas. So later on, there was a temporary alliance with the Hindu Mahasabha, which also didn't work. When that didn't work, he entered into an electoral alliance with the Indian uh, the Muslim League for the Calcutta Corporation election. And nobody in effect was happy with him because nobody could get him into their grip completely into their fold. He was always the man standing out with his own ideas. So this thing, this attitude continued even after uh, independence. Although uh, all these parties uh, exploited to the hilt the mass dis uh, discontent and the uprising uh, revolving the, uh, going around the INA soldiers' trials, the Red Foot trials and uh, the extended trials that went on, uh, they could uh, never uh, take Subhas completely. Nobody could appropriate him, uh, so to speak. And he was marginalized by all of them. But because of his popularity, he was so popular at the mass level, they could not ignore him. And on the other hand, they could not appropriate him because they had serious ideological issues with him. And so that left him hanging somewhere in the beginning. In, in between, and uh, he remained inconvenient. And because of this inconvenience, he 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 never featured in the mainstream political discourse in uh, Free India the way Nehru or Gandhi or Ambedkar, even Jayaprakash Narayan or Lohia have featured. So that's that's the reason for calling him an inconvenient nationalist. So you know, in your book, there are many uh, aspects uh, of his uh, life uh, which which are not very well known for most of the general public today. And uh, you know, coming to the earlier his early years, his school years, and, you know, his his childhood in Katak and Ravenshaw College, till he goes to ICS. I mean, that's you have touched very briefly on his family and his brothers. Uh, but did it play a, a, a role like those early years, those pre-ICS years uh, in making him who he was, his family, his five brothers, his parents? What is your perspective on, on that? Uh, yeah, I uh, see. He was born uh, in a family that was a huge one. And uh, he was uh, most probably the 13th or the 14th uh, child uh, uh, of his parents. And uh, his father was, uh, it was an aristocratic family. And uh, his father was a Rai Bahadur, which uh, later on he gave up that title. Uh, and uh, he was a government leader. Uh, and and uh, I think, as far as I remember, also a chairperson of the Kata municipality. Uh, so it was a very uh, busy household, a very political household, and also a, a very composite household in the sense that uh, as a child, he felt pretty neglected. He felt very insignificant. His father was a towering figure. His uh, mother was uh, quite busy, but she was the closest to him. And uh, uh, he, he became uh, emotionally attached, close, 
to one of the uh, uh, women helpers in the household who took care of him. But, and from a very early stage, uh, he was a shy kid and uh, a very uh, stubborn one also at the same time. And, and uh, so when he uh, was growing up, he was, uh, he, his first stage of schooling was in a European school. So that was uh, a completely European upbringing with uh, European values and morals and everything. But later on, very soon, he was moved to uh, an Indian school where he learned about, more about, uh, and that was the first time he started learning Bengali. He didn't learn Bengali before that. So uh, Bengali, Sanskrit, and uh, other Indian uh, subjects and values, that's when he started inculcating. And one of the first things that happened it was uh, uh, inspiration from the headmaster of the new school. Uh, the, the headmaster whose name was Beni Madhavdas had, had a profound influence on him. He was uh, introduced uh, to uh, Swami Vivekananda at that time, Swami Vivekananda and Ramakrishna Paramans. So he went deep into spiritualism, self-study, self-analysis and uh, serious study. And he was also reading, uh, because he was studying Sanskrit, he was also reading the uh, uh, the epics uh, like Mahabharata uh, in original Sanskrit. So uh, it, it was a very, very Indian traditional upbringing he started having from this time. And because of his uh, exposure to spirituality, and the spirituality which was not only individual, but had a very, very big social aspect, a social component, he started uh, going out uh, for doing uh, social services, so taking care of the sick people, uh, helping people in any way that he could, and uh, going out with his friends to different places and uh, uh, providing relief measures wherever necessary. Often in in, in clash with his in, in uh, disobedience to his parents and all. And uh, as it continued, uh, and at one stage, but in his early teens, he left home without telling anybody to find a guru with one of his friends. Uh, one of his closest friends called uh, Hemanta Kumar Sarkar. Uh, they went uh, to Haridwar, they went uh, to Rishikesh and uh, traveled down to Gaya, uh, through Agra and all. So, so those who traveled extensively and nobody in the house knew, they thought that he was gone, he was lost. So the, uh, the parents, you can imagine the mental state of the parents. They were going here to their running pillar to post trying to find their son. Uh, so they, these two kids, they go around uh, meeting many Akharas and sannyasis and gurus. Finally, uh, they were sent back by uh, Swami Brahmananda, who was a direct disciple of uh, Sri Ramakrishna, uh, who told them that this is not the time to take sannyas. First, you go back, complete your studies. There is a lot of work to be done. Take care of your parents. So then they came back. and But this streak continued. So after completing the schools there, where he, and he was, throughout, he was an excellent student. He was a, he was a brilliant student. So it almost appears that he did not have to put too much effort into his studies to score high marks and uh, stand uh, either first or second in the class. Uh, so after completing uh, studies in Qatar, he comes to Kolkata, takes admission in uh, uh, Presidency College, where uh, his friend circle expand and uh, a lot of the secret revolutionary societies uh, try to co-opt him. And, and his friends are in those uh, different groups some of them uh, are following different religious path, but many of them, most of them were with uh, one group, revolutionary group or the other. So he, he decides not to join any particular group at that time. So, and he uh, goes into debating, joins the debating society, edits the uh, college magazine and goes into that kind of cultural activity, which, are, which he believes uh, were important for developing his confidence and uh, developing his skills. And then this incident happens when a group of students uh, assault a professor in the presidency college and uh, he takes the blame. Although he, he didn't hit him, he was uh, just around the corner. He was not even among the group of the students who assaulted the professor. But he took the blame. As, as a leader of the student, he took the blame. He didn't give out the name of the students who were actually responsible for assaulting. So that talks a lot about his character. He, he put his career at stake to protect uh, his uh, friends' uh, careers. 
so uh, you know the one a very a turning point a kind of turning point uh, in his life comes when uh, he decides to go to study uh, ics to become an ics officer and you know it's again a what if of history of how it would have been different and he he then decides he doesn't want to be an ics officer and then he puts very little effort in his exams and the, when the result comes he's almost i think fourth Uh, in the class, yeah. and he's effortlessly passed. So, why did he not decide to go for ICS, and how did it did did his entry come into politics? Because there is one very interesting fact, which uh, you know a lot of uh, things about, uh, which your book brings out, is his uh, career with uh, you know Babu Chitranjan Das, and also the his great role in the calcutta municipal corporation and most of us like most indians are not aware that he played such an important role in the calcutta municipal corporation uh well uh, about uh, being uh, becoming an ics officer he was always uh, very sure that he didn't want to be he it was not interested what he was interested in was going abroad going to the, uh, to england and uh, doing further studies but his father put the condition that if you have to go there you have to become an i you have to appear for the ics exams and if you pass you have to take up that test so he agreed to go and sit for the ics exam otherwise he couldn't have gone so he went but even before uh, it was quite clear from his letters to his friends it was quite clear that he was not interested in uh, becoming an ics officer so he had 8 months around 8 months and uh, uh, appearing for ics exams and, and uh, simultaneously doing his Uh, carrying on with his studies in Cambridge, uh, it was very tough, and uh, eight months was ab- 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 absolutely no time to prepare and uh, score well in the exams. But uh, as I said, I mean, s- uh, scoring high uh, it seems to come to him quite effortlessly, quite naturally. And uh, he he studied, he studied vociferously, he studied very hard, vigorously, and went into the study, uh, into the exams, and. Uh, he could have probably even become uh, come first in the exams uh, had he not thrown away uh, a chunk of number in his sanskrit paper so what happened in the sanskrit paper is there was a uh, uh, high scoring uh, this thing uh, high score bearing uh, translation piece he did the translation he completed the translation in rough papers but couldn't uh, copy it in his fair exam answer paper so that that a big chunk of marks was lost in that year had he got there those marks uh, i guess that he would have probably come first that year and uh, but as the results came out it it uh, there was some debate discussion going on he knew that his father would be very very upset and wouldn't agree so he continued to argue with his father through his elder brother sarat so sarat he had to convince sarat sarat was his advocate and would pass on his point of view to the to their father and uh, finally he decided that i i cannot serve uh, both my country and this foreign government i would not i cannot uh, I, i cannot do that if i have to be true to myself so uh, there was no question of joining the civil service and uh, i mean some sources say that he even mohammed ali jinnah met him in london uh, and uh, uh, advised him to join the ics but uh, he was in no mood and he quit uh, the ics and uh, came back to india but while he was in cambridge he was noticing things were developing very rapidly in india the jallianwala bag massacre had taken place uh, mahatma gandhi had come, come onto the scene and was emerging as the national leader so uh, he was noticing all this and he was also noticing that in bengal chitrangan das was emerging to be the top leader so he wrote uh, a number of letters to chitrangan das uh, requesting him to take him on uh, into the congress work and he wrote to him very clear categorical suggestive uh, letters i mean suggestive in the sense that he was just 24 years old and chitrangan das was already a national leader so he was presumptuous enough to write what the congress should do how the congress should be reorganized what kind of divisions it should have it should have a planning division it should have a research division it should have a publicity division congress should have its own office so those are very very cogent and well thought plans uh, which he presented to chitrangan so chitrangan asked him to come over and uh, uh, join the congress work so suvas came back to india in 1921 uh, around june uh, around that time mid 1921 met mahatma gandhi in bombay uh, i had a long chat with him 
he was not uh, very happy with uh, the future plan of Mahatma Gandhi, the way he envisaged the national uh, struggle to develop his plans regarding how to uh, get better of the uh, British Raj. He was not very happy with the way he uh, explained things. He thought that Mahatma Gandhi lacked, Mahatma Gandhi's plans lacked clarity. So he came back to Kolkata and uh, met uh, Chitranjan Das and was completely overwhelmed by his thoughts and vision and his personality. He immediately joined uh, the Congress work. This one, Chitranjan appointed him as uh, the principal of the National College, which he had set up for students who had left the schools and colleges during the non-cooperation movement. And uh, so was uh, studiously devoted his time to developing that college. He was also appointed the uh, publicity uh, secretary of the Bengal Provincial Congress. So he was busy with that. Uh, and uh, many organizational res responsibilities he took up. Then uh, this one too, when he formed the Swarajya Party, he was, of course, completely heart and soul devoted to the Deshpandu, and he joined the Swarajya Party, which won uh, convincingly the Bengal elections of 1923. And in 1924, when the elections took place uh, for the Calcutta Municipal Corporation, the Swarajya Party again won uh, the majority. Deshpandu became the mayor, and uh, Subhash was appointed the chief executive officer. One aspect of Subhash was that is often uh, forgotten or not uh, discussed is his passion for uh, municipal governance, which he called municipal socialism. That he believed that these urban centers, the municipalities, uh, should become the, the magnets for the attracting talent, industry, finance, and lead the development of the region. And when he was exiled to Europe in the 1930s, he made it a point to go to all the uh, large municipalities, to the, the Berlin, Vienna, Prague, uh, I mean, just name it, all the European uh, cities, major cities he visited. They, he was given, conducted tours and uh, detailed uh, information regarding the functioning of all these municipalities, which he very meticulously noted down everything and passed, them, passed these notes on to the Calcutta Corporation uh, for them to uh, consider the plans and try to develop themselves. So that's how, I mean, he emerged, a, a personality which is very different from the politicians who was most comes about. Now coming to uh, one of the most well, I mean, uh, generally talked about uh, matter is his dispute and his differences with Mahatma Gandhi. Now, interestingly, in your book, it comes across as uh, you know, Mahatma Gandhi playing the smart politician and how he, he just maneuvered uh, things and did not get, get in its way. And general perception is that it was Nehru versus Bose, but it was not so. It was Gandhi who was opposed to Subhash Chandra Bose. So can you just, you know, in a way that our audience can easily understand, just make it simplify for us that what was the difference? I mean, why was uh, uh, Gandhi so against... Uh, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose. Well, uh, Gandhi and Bose were uh, as different as is possible between uh, two human beings. Completely different. Their worldviews were different. Their mental makeups were different. Yet, there was a, a ground for mutual respect where Subhash had no uh, qualms in accepting, acknowledging and talking about Gandhi's role in uh, reorganizing or even bringing up uh, the Indian population, getting India's politics across the masses, amongst the masses, raising their awareness and organizing them. So there, he had absolutely no qualms in admitting Gandhi's role in, there, in, in that phase. So for him, that was no less a revolutionary action, which Gandhiji could... Uh, uh, do in a very short period of time. He reorganized the Congress, reorganized the Congress constitution, took politics to the nooks and corners of the country, uh, intermingled with people at the grassroots level. And what was earlier uh, 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 a zone for only Western educated uh, the elite class, Gandhi took it much, much wider scale. So politics under Gandhi really became national. 
So Subhas was absolutely aware of it, and we were never stopped praising that. At the same time, when he entered politics and when he started uh, as a, as a young man, his vision, his demand was also always for complete independence. And the economic thoughts and uh, in his mental makeup, Nehru was definitely Nehru and Bose were close than Gandhi uh, and Bose. But uh, Nehru was uh, emotionally and spiritually uh, absolutely so wedded with Gandhiji that he could never break off. So we see instance after instance, uh, example after example, where after agreeing with Subhash's plan of action or Subhash's ideas, when it came to the crunch, when it came, uh, came to the time to take a stand, Nehru would go back to Gandhian camp and do what Gandhi would uh, ask. And the biggest example, the, their political career started with the biggest example when uh, Nehru uh, moved the independence resolution in the Madras Congress of 1927. Uh, Gandhiji was there, present there, but not in the podium at that time. And uh, Nehru moved the resolution that independence is the goal of the Congress. And Gandhiji was livid with it. Gandhiji was uh, absolutely scathing in his criticism of Nehru. And Nehru wrote an equally bitter uh, letter to Gandhiji. And when Gandhiji came back saying that, fine, uh, this is all fine and this is good and there is no problem, but it's time for you to act according to your conviction and uh, probably we should go separate ways. So immediately Nehru gave up and said that, no, I mean, how can you even consider the, the possibility of me going away from you or breaking away from you? Whatever you are saying is absolutely fine and I will go. With you. And this is the pattern which continued till the time Subhash was present in India, which is the, towards the end of 1940. Time and again, time and again, time and again. And I have uh, showed all those examples in the book. So this was a big disappointment for Subhas. And he wrote about it very clearly in his uh, book, uh, The Indian Struggle, which he wrote while uh, being in the European exile. And uh, from early 1930s, Subhas was completely disillusioned with Gandhiji's uh, political vision. Political vision. And he but they, uh, Subhash Bose and Sardar Vallabhai Patel's elder brother, Vital Bhai Patel, issued a joint statement uh, uh, from Europe together uh, criticizing Gandhiji when he called off the uh, civil disobedience movement. They called him, they called Gandhiji a piece of uh, old furniture. <laughs> so uh, he took a very, very string, stringent and strong stand and expressed himself in very strong language. But uh, his, his friendship with Nehru actually uh, grew. And they came closer till the 1939, uh, the year 1939, when the fight came out in the open and uh, Nehru tried to remain neutral for some time, but then finally went back to the Gandhian camp. And the, the distance that uh, came in between them, that could not be uh, reproached, that could, that could not be uh, breached ever again. So, so in, that was the difference. Coming to my next question, and that is that you know, Subhash Chandra Bose decides to leave India uh, through Afghanistan. He goes to Germany. Uh, I mean, uh, one one letter which in your book, uh, which really raised my eyebrows was that, you know, he wrote to Ribbentrop uh, about uh, how the Soviet, American and British propaganda is making Germany to be an aggressor. And then, uh, you know, from there uh, he goes, I mean, he gets disappointed and he goes to Japan. Now, you have touched upon it uh, in your book, but was he not aware of the atrocities which the Nazis were committing or even the fact is he was in Nanjing where the Japan had carried out horrific massacres and what was happening to even the Indians. I mean, we hear a lot of Indian horror stories of, of the atrocities right. which Indians had to suffer in Burma and also uh, what was, I mean, uh, was he not aware or was the India's independence more important than all these things? How how do you how do we explain that bit? Okay, I mean, uh, before, I mean, when you ask this question, uh, the question that should precede this is what was the primary goal of any national leader at that time? It was India's independence. Uh, when we in the twenty first century ask these kind of questions, they are pertinent questions, logical questions. But we also need to remember that Subhas Chandra Bose was uh, not an editor of a magazine or not an admin, admin of a 
Facebook group or uh, a Twitter campaigner or a YouTube uh, influencer. He was there fighting for India's freedom. And for him, he would do anything that takes to get India her freedom. Now, yes, let's break this down. I mean, uh, in his 1938 speech, he makes it very clear that it is not our concern what is happening inside other countries. The domestic issues, the domestic politics of other countries are their headache, their business. It's not our business. Our business, our sole aim at this moment is to make India free. And we will do whatever that, whatever has to be done for that. Now, that is uh, the fundamental, the foundation of his foreign policy. And that is the fundamental foreign uh, foundation of foreign policy followed by every country in the world, probably except India, where we love to moralize and theorize and talk in high abstract terms and do nothing other than being subservient to other interests. So we play into others' hands. I mean, that's the reason why uh, the Soviet Union was in Afghanistan. That's the reason why the US were in Vietnam, in Afghanistan. That's the reason why a country like uh, uh, Great Britain supported uh, the Saudi Arabia for the UN uh, Human Rights Council. It's all in self-interest. So in 1939, he made it very clear in his speech. And that's those letters, I believe, should be written in golden letters, those words, that India's own interests come first. And he was a man who was far ahead of his time. And the, the biggest evidence is that this line came back to Indian modern history, current politics in 2013 when it became more this slogan, India first. So it's people resonated with that idea, India first. And everybody realized that India was theorizing, moralizing, talking in vacuum and not being honest either to herself or to the world. So when was Suhas aware of the atrocities on the Jews? Yes, he was. Was he aware of the Holocaust? No, he wasn't. Atrocities on the Jews started very early and atrocities on Indian students was the, something that Suhas himself witnessed when he was in exile. And he took a very, very strong stand against it. And he wrote letters to the German Foreign Office in very strong critical terms. He said that Germans, German nationalism, new nationalism is extremely narrow, selfish and arrogant. And this is doing great harm uh, to uh, Germany's relationship with India. So he could talk and he was one of the few leaders who was not giving statements to newspapers, mind it, but he was directly, frontally attacking the government's policies when he was living in Europe and was dealing with their governments. So he was dealing with officers of the uh, National Socialist Party with the other uh, fascist organizations and criticizing them on their face that you are racists, you are, uh, uh, you are passing laws and adopting policies which are doing harm to our Indian students. And he helped the Indian students to regroup, to organize their action, write petitions on their behalf. He himself wrote petitions on their behalf and uh, wrote in the European newspapers about these poli racist policies, criticizing them. He wrote against uh, the Japanese aggression in China. In his uh, uh, mouthpiece forward block, he criticized the German uh, aggression, the Jap German imperialism, Japanese imperialism. So in terms of political ideology, he was just as far removed from these powers as anybody uh, like uh, Nehru or Gandhi was. But what Nehru and Gandhi, uh, the stand they took for them, the principles, abstract principles uh, were more important for them. For Subhas, it was practical politics where although he deferred with the uh, political philosophy of these Axis powers, he would not hesitate to take their help to drive out the British. And same with Japan. So, uh, I mean, when the, uh, the rumor spread in India that Subhash is coming at the head of a Japanese army to liberate India, so Pandit Nehru says, I will fight Subhash with a sword and, you know, I will be the first one to stop him. And 
stop him from work from doing work the japanese are not going to uh, set up their uh, uh, empire in india so i mean there was a lot of hot talk and then there was uh, some practical real politics which we see suvas's line of geopolitics foreign relations is something that has been followed by all countries in the world throughout it's not that he stands out as an opportunist or something opportunism is the key word there in uh, geopolitics so uh, uh, anybody who wants to brand him through this should read his critique of uh, nazi and uh, fascist philosophers so uh, you know the official version uh, what uh, of uh, netaji's death is that you know there was an air crash in formosa which is now taiwan and uh, you know he passed away there in an air crash but you know you have written a uh, your first book the conundrum on uh, netaji's as you say life after death uh, so you know i mean if you can please tell us something more about it i mean that will encourage our viewers to pick up your first book as well on which even a movie has been made so what what actually happened as per your research well that's a that's a huge uh, uh, field uh, complex topic by itself and uh, very very complex but the long and short of it is that uh, the story of his death in a plane crash in 1945 smoke screen which was created by the uh, japanese probably the southern command of the japanese army to escape and just like he had planned his exit because i mean here we have to remember another aspect of suvas bose's personality that he was not an impulsive person he did not uh, take any hot headed discussion on the spot decision on the spot uh, reacting to some sudden development he would plan far ahead i mean you had asked this question earlier when did he plan to leave india he left india in 1941 january but he was planning his exit from india at least from 1939 november so there was more than a year of planning and he was exploring all options whether he should go out uh, from the bay of bengal through the uh, chinese sea through the uh, chinese coast and then reach soviet union or should he go through the tried and tested route of uh, afghanistan and then uh, go into get into the russian territory there so the things were planned and even here when the war is coming war was coming to an end he had already i mean by by that the infall and the koima operations had ended uh, the the ina was defeated the japanese were defeated and they were retreating so, so at that time suvas was uh, reorganizing the ina he was in fact recruiting army getting more and more people trained and trying to create another attack uh, trying to create another uh front for uh, the resistance and moving into india he hadn't given up the idea but he was also calculating what would happen if the uh, allied forces land and come down to singapore to thailand and uh, uh, the capture the southeast asian countries so his exit plan was what time and uh, from multiple sources we see that he had planned to go to the manchurian region and negotiate with russia and he was writing to the japanese government also constantly that let me come as a mediator between you and the russians uh, because uh, the russians were planning to attack uh, japan as soon as the war was coming to an end and the the battle between them was inevitable and the other thing which was was constantly speaking about was that the allied powers the alliance between the allied powers was not going to be sustainable they that it wouldn't last he, and he was very clear that as soon as the war is over you just wait and watch uh, the british and the americans will be on one side russians will be on the other side they are going to fight among themselves and we should take that opportunity and uh, take russia's help if we cannot achieve our goal from south east asia so with that goal he had created his exit plan that he would go to russia raise another army and then come back to india probably that was probably the idea now this entire thing had to be done in absolute secrecy and uh, the smoke screen was created by the japanese they, they helped him escape what exactly happened after that is not known and uh, it won't be possible to be known 
uh, unless the Japanese government and India's own government declassify all the uh, relevant intelligence files on it. But what we have been able to figure out is the fag end of the story. That Subhash Bose returned to India in the early 1950s, alive. And he stayed in India. It, it sounds fantastic. It sounds absurd. It sounds ridiculous. But I would request you and your viewers to read Koran Ram because, I mean, you know, I mean, whatever fantastic it sounds in whichever way, and you might think I am a crackpot. But when you go through the evidence, even you cannot ignore the evidence, the, the massive amount of evidence that exists. Fascinating, fascinating. So thank you so much for taking out your time and uh, speaking to us. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, our viewers would want to know more about the fascinating facets of the life of Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose would read, uh, you know, would love to read your book as well as pick up your uh, first book, The Conundrum, to know what what are the evidences, uh, uh, you know, I mean, Absolutely. what probably is one of the theories of, of what happened to him. So thank you so much for speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure.